On the 10th of April 2019, the New Statesman put out an article named Roger Scruton, Cameron's resignation was the death knell for the Conservative Party. The government advisor and philosopher reflects on Brexit and responds to charges of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Now, initially, this looks like just your bog standard interview. However, for those of you that don't know, Roger Scruton is very much conservative, having written numerous books on the matter of conservatism and the philosophy of conservatism. The New Statesman is generally a socialist paper, with people such as Paul Mason, a well-known Manchester socialist, writing regular articles for the magazine. And so the article starts off. It was in Paris in May 1968, as French workers and students revolted, that Roger Scruton became a conservative. I was woken up then. I wasn't really political until that moment. The author and philosopher recalled when we met recently in his flat in Albany, the rarefied apartment complex opposite Fortnum and Mason in Piccadilly, London. I thought, here is the most beautiful city in the world with its wonderful culture, all the things that I've just learned to appreciate, and these wretched spoiled brats are trying to pull it all down. I had an old-fashioned English puritanical revolt against it. Now, if that doesn't sound like the opposite of socialist, I don't know what does. Since then, Scruton, now 75, has become something of a one-man think tank, writing more than 50 books on politics, philosophy, religion and culture, founding and editing the Salisbury Review from 1982 to 2001, hosting a 10-day summer school in his Wiltshire farm with the unintentionally comical name Scrutopia, and most recently becoming head of the government's Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission in November 2018. His sacking was unsuccessfully demanded by Labour MPs and others on account of his past remarks on Hungarian Jews, part of the Soros Empire, Islamophobia, a propaganda word, and homosexuality, which he apparently said is not normal. It's upsetting because it's meant to undermine your authority. Scruton, who was knighted in 2016, said he reflected on the affair. And authority is the only thing I have. Authority that comes from hard work and thinking. So a load of socialists tried to get a conservative sacked from his position in the government. And now a socialist paper is writing about him and throwing in parts of his Islamophobia and a Jewish conspiracy, eh? I wonder where this interview's going. What surprised me was the kind of people who repeated this. You expect people who spend their lives on Twitter to have this store of malice, but when it comes up in Parliament as it did, I was astonished. Scruton is unrepentant, however, about the remarks that earn him such opprobrium. Anybody who doesn't think that there's a Soros empire in Hungary has not observed the facts, he said, heedless of the anti-Semitic portrayal of the philanthropist George Soros as a Jewish puppet master. It was nonsense, but Scruton continued, to accuse the Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban of anti-Semitism. The pair have been friends since their meeting in Budapest since in 1987. The same applied, he insisted, to charges of Islamophobia. The Hungarians were extremely alarmed by the sudden invasion of huge tribes of Muslims from the Middle East. Islamophobia was, he repeated, a propaganda word invented by the Muslim Brotherhood in order to stop discussion of the major issues. So basically, Scruton hasn't said any lies here yet, but it sounds bad, and the way it's being portrayed is, oh, all these accusations are correct. <laughs> like, honestly, the new statesman, this is pretty poor. Perhaps most remarkably, he commented of the rise of China. They're creating robots out of their own people. Each Chinese person is a kind of replica of the next one, and that is a very frightening thing. Scruton has long prided himself on his contempt for utopia schemes to remake the world and society. How does he respond to the charge that Brexit, which he favours, is one such project? What I really think is that David Cameron should not have given us the chance for a referendum if he did not intend to go through with the result. I think that was a major constitutional betrayal, and I suspect that most people would feel that. He elaborated, Cameron's resignation really was the death knell of the Conservative Party as we knew it, because that's something a proper Conservative politician cannot do. Renounce leadership at the moment when it's needed. They are two really odd paragraphs to put together. First, they put the paragraph where it seems the only thing he had of note to say about China was the fact that all the people are turning into robots as the government want them to, which is a communist state, so I'm not surprised. But then they go on to say, oh, he's totally against utopian thinking, which socialism is. And then here's all the things he thinks about Brexit, which is all true and all fine. But it's just that why would you have him say something that seems so remarkably strange for socialists to read and then put it next to something reasonable? It's almost like you want this type of thought to be seen as bad or wrong. It's a very, very strange way to put it. That's all I'm saying. Scruton was a little more favourable towards the Prime Minister whose government appointed him. 
I can't say that Theresa May would have been my choice. She's obviously an honest, respectable, somewhat old-fashioned, wooden person. She's doing her best. But it's not what the country needs. Someone prepared to pursue a no-deal Brexit? Yes. Evelyn Waug once lamented that the Conservative Party had never put the clock back a single second. Does Scruton agree? I think that's his romanticism. Of course it's true. But it's not entirely true. What the word conservatism means is not putting things back, but conserving them. There are things that are threatened and you love them, so you want to keep them. Has he been surprised by the resurgence of socialist politicians such as Jeremy Corbyn, who Scruton once remarked reminded him of his father? In the end, I'm not really surprised because the decline of education means that people don't understand any more of what it was. They haven't got the historical narrative that will tell you exactly why communism leads to the gulag. So they've added in another line that socialists reading a socialist magazine are not going to like. The fact that he <laughs> says, as a matter of fact, which it is, that communism inevitably leads to gulags. However, it continues. But Scruton, who retains a conservative scepticism of the free market, confessed that he was tempted by the idea of renationalising the railways. They seem to run quite well in places that they're nationalised. He is repulsed by some of the consequences of globalisation. It is outrageous that Amazon doesn't pay any tax in this country, or hardly any at all, but it operates from Luxembourg, which is a tin-pot little place, which seems to be getting more and more power over us. A lot more could have been done to discipline international business. Does he feel any optimism about the future? I've never been an optimist, but that's fine because pessimists have the possibility of being agreeably surprised. What is known as optimism is really a collection of illusions. One must recognise that all religious people know which is that human beings are imperfect and fallen and there's no way in which they cannot surmount the problems which they create. And that is the end of the article. Now you're probably wondering why I spent the last seven minutes reading out some random article from some random magazine about some random political thinker and philosopher. Well, the reason is that he got fired from his position at Build Better, Build Beautiful, all from this article that George Eaton wrote. And also, due to a Twitter hate mob. In fact, it was so bad that he had to write an apology for it in The Spectator. Roger Scruton, an apology for thinking. I hope it should be obvious by now that this isn't going to be an open apology to everyone who was offended, but instead an apology for trying to live in the modern world. I recently gave an interview to the New Statesman, on the assumption that, as the magazine's former wine critic, I would be treated with respect and that the journalist, George Eaton, was sincere in wanting to talk to me about my intellectual life. Not for the first time I am forced to acknowledge what a mistake it is to address young leftists as though they were responsible human beings. Here is my brief response to an unscrupulous collection of my out-of-context remarks, some of them merely words designed to accuse me of thought crimes, and to persuade the government that I am not fit to be chairman of the commission recently entrusted to me. If for some reason you think that these accusations are misplaced on George Eaton, I want you to bear in mind that this now-deleted Instagram post was made by George Eaton, drinking a bottle of champagne, saying the feeling when you get right-wing, racist and homophobic, Roger Scruton sacked as a Tory government advisor, meaning that this was indeed a hit job. Eaton repeats the libel, uttered under parliamentary privilege originally, that I believed in some kind of Jewish conspiracy theory. Here is what I said in the speech, discussing the idea of the nation-state and delivered to the Hungarian Academy, in which the relevant words occurred. The Jewish minority here in Hungary that survived the Nazi occupation suffered further persecution under the communists, but nonetheless is active in making its presence known. Many of the Budapest intelligentsia are Jewish, and form part of the extensive network around the Soros Empire. People in these networks include many who are rightly suspicious of nationalism, regard nationalism as the major cause of tragedy of Central Europe in the 20th century, and do not distinguish nationalism from the kind of national loyalty that I have defended in this talk. Moreover, as the world knows, indigenous anti-Semitism still plays a part in Hungarian society and politics, and presents an obstacle to the emergence of a shared nation loyalty among ethnic Hungarians and Jews. I'm going to be honest, that sounds incredibly reasonable. In retrospect, I could have chosen the words more carefully, but my purpose was to point out that anti-Semitism has become an issue in Hungary and an obstacle to the shared national identity. As for the Soros Empire, I am the only person I know who has actually tried to persuade Viktor Orban to accept its presence. 
and that of Central European University in particular in Hungary. I did not succeed, but that is another matter. I should add that I am neither a friend nor an enemy of Orban, but know him from the days when I helped him and his colleagues to set up a free university under the communists. What Orban did then was the first step towards the liberation of his country, and George Soros was one of those who helped him too. It is sad for Hungary that the two have fallen out, and that the old spectre of anti-Semitism has been reborn from their clash. Given their two aggressive personalities, however, it is hardly surprising. So there we go. This whole article is basically him explaining everything. I am going to read it all out, because I think it's interesting to see how much context is missing from the first article from the New Statesman. Then there is the Islamophobia. It seems that by questioning this word and pointing out its origin in the Muslim Brotherhood's propaganda campaigns, I am somehow showing myself to be guilty of the offence that it describes. I deplore the current use of this word, since this implies that there is some peculiar and irrational state of mind from which all objections to Islam need proceed. I myself distinguish Islam as a faith and a way of life, from the radicals who commit crimes in its name, I have respect and tenderness towards the first of those, and a hatred of the second, but it is increasingly difficult with the current abuse of language to make this point or encourage Muslims to make it too. I think of homophobia as a similar word, designed to close all debate about a matter in which only one view is now deemed permissible. Apparently I once wrote that homosexuality is not normal, but nobody has told me where, or why this is a particularly offensive thing to say anyway. Red hair too is not normal, nor is decency among left-wing journalists. <laughs> nice. In Sexual Desire 1986, I argue that homosexuality is different from heterosexuality, but not in itself a perversion, and I try to explain the negative response that many people have towards homosexual relations in other terms. Finally, my comments on China. I was describing the attempt of the Chinese Communist Party to achieve conformity of behaviour in everything that might threaten its comprehensive political control, and I think it is fair to describe this as an attempt to roboticise the Chinese people. The Communist Party expects each person to replicate the behavioural code, not questioning its authority and finding safety in imitation. Many people see the threat of this in the attitude of Beijing towards Hong Kong. Far more important, to my mind, is the internment of a million or more Uyghur Muslims, in order to clean their minds of dangerous god ideas and reprogram them with the party idea instead. If we are not allowed to criticise this as a roboticising of victims, then what are we allowed to criticise and how? We in Britain are entering a dangerous social condition in which the direct expression of opinions that conflict or merely seem to conflict with a narrow set of orthodoxies is instantly punished by a band of self-appointing vigilantes. We are being cowed into abject conformity around a dubious set of official doctrines and told to adopt a worldview that we cannot examine for fear of being publicly humiliated by the censors. This world view might lead to a new and liberated social order, or it might lead to the social and spiritual destruction of our country. How shall we know if we are too afraid to discuss it? Absolutely nothing unreasonable said at any point in that article or quote-unquote apology. In fact, lots of humorous statements made. I mean, honestly, how can you character assassinate him if you are putting him in context? And the answer is you can't, which is why George Eaton tried to get him character assassinated and him fired from his position in government. So when accused of these inaccuracies and libel, George Eaton decides to write this article for the New Statesman on the 12th of April. On my interview with Roger Scruton, I stand by the accuracy of my interview, but apologise for my social media conduct. So basically he's saying, I'm sorry that you got offended at me drinking champagne for getting someone fired. On March 27th, I interviewed Roger Scruton. The piece was published as an encounter in the observation section of the New Statesman magazine, but also on the website on 10 April. As a result of his remarks in the interview, Scruton was sacked as chair of the government's Building Better, Building Beautiful commission. The allegations have since been levelled by the Spectator's associate editor, Douglas Murray, and others that I lied or invented quotes by Scruton, and even that I have retracted sections of the interview. This is an untrue and baseless claim. I do have to say, Muglis was absolutely unrelenting on Twitter. Every morning, he would at George Eaton to say, release the tape of the interview, which is something I will save for later in the video. Scruton on Islamophobia. When I asked Scruton whether he still believed that Islamophobia was a propaganda word, it was unambiguous. Absolutely, it was invented by the Muslim Brotherhood in order to stop discussion of a major issue. 
In the course of our conversation, he also spoke of the invention of a huge tribe of Muslims from the Middle East entering Hungary, a remark which neither Scruton nor Murray has defended. That's because it's true. 400,000 Muslims entered Hungary from the Middle East. That is a huge tribe of Muslims. And if you think tribe is a dehumanising word, you're an idiot. Tribes, by definition, can only be human. Scruton on the Chinese. When I asked Scruton whether he was optimistic or pessimistic about the world's future, he raised the subject of China. They're creating robots out of their own people by so constraining that what can be done, he said. Each Chinese person is a kind of replica of the next one, and that is a very frightening thing. In the published version of the interview I wrote, perhaps most remarkably, he commented on the rise of China. They're creating robots out of their own people. Each Chinese person is a kind of replica of the next one, and that is a very frightening thing. The omitted words, by so constraining what can be done, do not change the meaning of the sentence. Murray contends in a piece published on the Spectator website that Scruton's use of they refers to the Chinese Communist Party. That may be open to interpretation, Scruton did not refer directly to the party in our conversation, but the quotation itself is accurate and Scruton's choice of words at best is ill-advised. At best is ill-advised, meaning that there is no positive interpretation in the mind of George Eaton and things can only get worse than ill-advised words, rather than he meant the Chinese Communist Party. Which changes the entire interpretation of the sentence, making that entire refutation that George Eaton has just put in absolute nonsense. The rest of the article is just Eaton apologising for being an idiot on Twitter. But interestingly, when he mentions his post on Instagram, he mentions that he was drinking champagne, but doesn't mention that he called Roger Scruton a homophobe and was celebrating the fact that he got a right winger fired from his job, which I find particularly interesting. So, of course, so far, this has all just been George Eaton says Roger Scruton said one thing, Roger Scruton and Douglas Murray said that Roger Scruton said something else. However, this is all only provable with the tapes, which, as I mentioned before, Douglas Murray was constantly going on at the Statesman to release the tapes. Well, he sent out this tweet. To all those people wondering why I stopped asking George Eaton to release the tapes, it's because I got the tape. Oh dear, what is going to happen, George? So the next section of this video is just going to be completely unedited answers from George Eaton's questions by Roger Scruton about the subjects that he is accused of slandering him on, just so we can get the full context of what Roger Scruton said. Mm. I mean, one of the things which, which, which people jumped on was your, your description of Islamophobia as a propaganda word, but yeah. would, would, would you defend that now? It's... Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It was invented by the Muslim Brotherhood in order to stop dis discussion yes. of, a, of a major issue which we all are worried about. You know, we're all worried about the extent to which Islam uh, condones or does not condone the violence mm. um, committed in its name. I, I, I'm not, you know, I, I, uh, um, I think Douglas Murray has written quite well about this. And... Um, you know, I have a PhD student who you probably know, Ed Hussain. Mm, yes. Yeah, who's sort of very much uh, concerned with ha with getting from the Islamic tradition the other side to this question of what it is that Muslims really say and can say yes. about about the the violent manifestations of uh, of their own faith and that. That's what we have to do. We have to bring it into the open and discuss it. Mm. And this word is there to try and prevent that. Yes. <coughs> do you think Islam is compatible with Western traditions and democracy? Well, <clears throat> this is what Ed thinks, ultimately. And um, possibly not... I mean, it would have to recognise that s secular government takes precedence over religious obedience. Mm. And that is very hard. It was hard for us to recognise this, and it was only in the course of the 17th century that yes. we actually got to do it. And I think uh, Islam has to go through that process too. And whether it can is, you know... I mean, meanwhile, of course, uh, I entirely agree with what Ayan Hirshi Ali says, that... that, that there are two Islams. There's the the Islam of Mecca, uh, the original revelation, um, which 
which uh, gifted the Muslims with a, a peaceful way of life which was theirs and which included them and um, then there's the Islam of Medina uh, when a prophet had been forced into exile and was in a in fighting mood mm. and the Medina surahs of the Quran are just full of this anger and violence and and uh, need to impose things uh, and that's a different thing altogether and I mm. think r r the Muslims who settle into the Meccan way of life are obviously perfect citizens that's uh, and mm. they they have the inner serenity that the citizen should have and that's all we ought to learn to appreciate that and encourage mm. it but, mm. And then on the other side, you're, you're accused of anti-Semitism for, for your use of the term Soros Empire. Is that what, was the, what I did wrong? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I was talking about Hungary at the time, wasn't I? And, and anybody who doesn't think that there's a Soros Empire in Hungary has yeah. not observed the facts. Yes. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not necessarily an empire of Jews. Yes. I mean, that's, that's such nonsense. Yes. Uh, um, how can one possibly deal with that? Yes. Yes. <coughs> um, what is your What's your view of of Orban? Do you think that he's misrepresented in in the press? Uh, to some extent, he is. I think. Uh, um, I have a complex relation with Orban because I I helped him set up his uh, um, free university in in Budapest yes. in nineteen eighty eight. Uh, 1987, before the collapse of communism, when he was a young man, uh, and he and his colleagues were doing a fantastic job. That's when they started Fides, and I told them at the time, you shouldn't, you shouldn't make this into a youth party mm. because you're not going to be young forever. <laughs> um, you should make it into a constitutional conservative party of the old school. Then you've got a real um, tradition to build on. And they, that's what they did, but um, and it was all going pretty well. But I think power has gone to his head, um, and he has a huge charisma, mm. uh, and and he's made some decisions which are very popular with the Hungarian people, because they were the, the Hungarians were extremely alarmed by the sudden invasion mm. of uh, of um, huge tribes of, of Muslims from the Middle East. And it, you have to remember that their history is, uh, of their relation with Islam is not a happy one. Mm. Um, so, uh, and he made those radical decisions that, you know, that we're going to exclude all this. We're going to maintain the, the uh, security of our borders, come what may. And that's put him at loggerheads with the European Union. So he's got the whole propaganda machine to deal with. But I don't say that I agree with his policies in general. Um, I think he's getting too close to Russia. Um, but he's also being deliberately isolated by the European Union, mm. which is um, not, in my view, a wise thing. Mm. If, if, um, mm. You know, uh, it's the same problem as we have with the European Union. How do you negotiate something other than what's being dictated to you? Yes. He is, of course, regularly accused of anti-Semitism. Yeah, that's nonsense, though, in his case. I mean, he's this... Um, well, I assume it's nonsense. Uh, um, the Hungarians... But what I said in the speech that people quote from was... is true. I said that, you know, that there's, there's a legacy of anti-Semitism in Hungary, which you can't deny. You have to, you have to recognise that mm. if you're going to be... if you're going to form any kind of co coherent idea of what Hungary is as a nation. It has a, a large Jewish population who've got to be included. Um, and this was one of the great strengths of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, that it gave to the, the Jews uh, a sense of national identity as well as their ethnic mm. and religious identity. And that was in danger of being lost because of the Nazi um, takeover. And all the, all the, and then the communist takeover, which was also all part of that. 
Mm. So, um, so you you should never ignore the possibility of anti-Semitism and the situation of the Jew in Hungary. If you want to have a nation state, nothing. Victor is aware of that, and he's done a lot you know, with Holocaust memorials and all that sort of mm. stuff to include Jews in his his particular form of, of national politics, but it's not surprising that they don't necessarily want to be included. Yes. Um, uh, uh, and it's not surprising if they draw, draw, join up with Soros's transnational campaign against Orban. Hmm. So, oh, it's just such a complicated matter. All I would yes. say is that, that, you know, there's no easy solution to this. And that, but it's not the case that Orban is anti-Semitic. He is trying to find his own solution. Yes. Um, and if you had a if you had a political movement in Hungary which excluded the Jews in some way, you'd be damn foolish because they are the ones with with the minds. Mm. And many of you know that they, they've been uh, as the Budapest intel intelligentsia. Many of them are Jewish, and they've inherited a long history of political thinking. Mm. which has been extremely useful to previous generations of Hungarians. Mm. In the same way that Islamophobia is used to suppress debate, do you sometimes feel that the term anti-Semitism is used in the same way, that clearly yeah. there are Jews on the left who do try to exert influence through politics, yes. and, and, and sometimes a normal critique of that is, is prevented through... I think that's right. I, th I think that... Um, a lot of the stuff about anti-Semitism in the Labour Party um, comes from this, you know, that uh, it's not necessarily anti-Semitic to be anti-Zionist, um, uh, that there is an issue, of course, that um, um, the Labour Party has tried a lot of re recruiting among inner-city Muslim communities mm which are often anti-Semitic, and so has suppressed uh, all that. But, um, but yes, it, 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 to get a clear, open debate on the left about anti-Semitism is as difficult as getting a debate on the right about Islamophobia. Hmm. And, and beyond politics, how do you feel about humanity's future? Uh, um, oh, gosh. I mean, you're talking about all the transhumanist stuff and all that. Well, well partly that, but but uh, when you look at the, the, the various forces changing the world, are you, are you an optimist or, or, well, or a pessimist? I've, I've never been an optimist. Yes. Um, but that's fine, because, you know, uh, pessimists uh, have the possibility of being agreeably surprised, and that's, that's the reason for being pessimistic. But I've always defended a certain kind of pessimism because I think that what, what is known as optimism is really a collection of illusions. I think you must, one must recognise um, what all religious people know, which is that human beings are imperfect and fallen and there's no way in which uh, they can alone surmount the problems which they themselves create. I think we, have, we are in a difficult... There are difficulties around the corner that we um, are ignoring, like the rise of China. And there's something quite frightening about the Chinese sort of mass politics mm. uh, uh, and the regimentation of the, of the ordinary being. I think that... that um, and we invent robots... Uh, and they are the, uh, in a sense, they are creating robots out of their own people um, by so constraining what what can be done that um, that each China China Chinese person is a a kind of replica of the the next one, mm. and that is a very frightening thing. Yes, um, maybe you maybe I don't know enough about it to be confident in making that judgment, but the politics is like that. And the foreign policy is like that, and the you know the the concentration camps have come back, um, hmm. largely there to to um, to uh, well to uh, 
re-educate the Muslims and so on. Mm. And that's about everything I need to cover from the tapes. Although I didn't cover the homophobia stuff, Roger Scruton does that himself by saying I'm accused of it, but no one can actually point to any evidence of it. He does mention it in the interview, but if you want to go see that, link is in the description. But I don't think I could go through this video without mentioning the man who managed to get this all out, and that is Douglas Murray. In The Spectator, he wrote an article called The Scruton Tapes, an anatomy of a modern hit job, how a character assassination unfolded on Twitter. The article starts off by mentioning that character assassinations are happening everywhere all over the world to conservative right-wing people, mentioning the Covington boys, and then he goes into the Sir Roger Scruton saga in more meticulous detail than I. But he ends the article by mentioning how the new statesmen reacted to this. But while certain conservative politicians seem set on appeasing what they take to be the spirit of the age, they might have misjudged the turn. Soon after Scruton's sacking, it started to become apparent that the quotations had been manipulated and that the philosopher had lost his job because government had cowed in front of the mob. Jason Cowley, the magazine's editor-in-chief, said the new statesman takes journalistic good practice seriously. As any responsible media organisation would, we are conducting an internal review in light of allegations of misrepresentation. George Eaton has already apologised for his behaviour on social media and his thoughtless Instagram post which he deleted. Mercer and Tugged Hat both ended up being forced to issue half apologies. Those who were most angry were young people who have grown to loathe this social media hate mongering, and I'm one of them. Their instincts are right. Our world is replete with complex matters we need discussing. We need philosophers, thinkers, and even politicians of courage to help us find our way through this. We live in an age of character assassination. What we now desperately need is a counter revolution based on the importance of individuals over mobs. The primacy of truth over offence, and the necessity of free thought over this bland, dumb and ill-conceived uniformity. And with that, I must say, my video has come to an end. There isn't much I can add on to that, as Douglas Murray is very good at saying a lot in two paragraphs. Which is a skill I wish to master someday. But, without further ado, that is the end of the video. So once again, thank you very much for watching, and until next time, goodbye.